My name is James, and I'm an uh, experimental particle physicist. And what that means is that I get together with a few thousand of my closest uh, colleagues, and uh, we take the smallest possible things in nature, and we accelerate them to, up to the highest possible speeds, and we slam them into each other to see what happens. Um, and the reason we do this is because we're looking for things that mankind has never seen before uh, at the very fundamental physical scales. Um, and so I'm here to share with you what uh, something called a dark photon is, but to do so I need to set a little bit of historical context. Um, that was an unsuccessful click, there we go. I need to uh, set a little bit of a historical context and um, uh, to flash back to 1894, when eminent physicist Albert Michelson said the following. He stood in front of an audience in front of, uh, at the University of Chicago, and he said the following. The more important fundamental laws and facts of physical science have all been discovered, and these are now so firmly established that the possibility of their ever being supplanted in consequence of new discoveries is exceedingly remote. Um, a couple of decades previous, um, electricity and magnetism had been shown to be two parts of the same force, electromagnetism, and this was considered such a gigantic breakthrough at the time that uh, there was a prevalent attitude amongst a lot of physicists that this was pretty much it, and the rest were some minor details. Um, but sometimes I wonder if people like this, out, Michelson didn't need to because he was about to get the Nobel, but I wonder sometimes if people like this say things like this with such definitive authority just so they can ensure their place in history as like grand historical straight men so that we can like look back 100 years later and marvel at how completely wrong they were. A different Albert, 1905, special relativity, 1915, general relativity, and then the early decades of the 1900s, quantum mechanics, and then the need to put quantum mechanics together with relativity led to something called quantum field theory, and any one of these things by themselves is such a, it required such a complete paradigm shift in our understanding of nature at its very basic scales that it's hard to imagine how Michelson could have been more wrong in his pronouncement. Um, and so then this, this, this uh, quantum field theory that we came up with was, um, was the language that allowed us to understand that basically had this amazing uh, interplay between um, theory and experiment in, in, in particle physics, in physics in the, uh, in the 20th century that culminated in this thing that we call the standard model of particle physics. And, uh, and uh, it's, it's, uh, it's essentially a list of all the particles, the fundamental particles that we know and the ways that they interact. And it's nicely summarized in this diagram from the movie Particle Fever. Um, it doesn't have any uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, significance beyond. It's just a really nice uh, way to put it down on, on a slide. And essentially, you have two basic classes of particles. You have the outer ring, which is matter particles, and they are uh, quarks and the electron. And then you have this inner ring, which, are, which is uh, um, populated by the so-called force-carrying particles, or gauge bosons. And so this is, uh, I mean, it's, a, it's an amazing, it's like an almost shockingly successful experimental theory, um, so much so that it actually earns that name, the standard model, capital S, capital M. Um, and uh, the, uh, uh, but I, I think uh, maybe a few ears may have perked up when I said that word boson. Anyone, anyone here heard of the Higgs boson? Okay, so for those of you who haven't heard of the Higgs boson, perhaps you know it by its more uh, sensationalistic name, the Kanye particle, sorry, the God particle. <laughs> so the, um, phys physicists don't care much for that name because it obscures the truly awesome nature of this particle. But nonetheless, in uh, July of 2012, excuse me, two of the collaborations, two of the experiments at the Large Hadron Collider, ATLAS, the one that I work on, and CMS, a complementary experiment, um, it's at the Large Hadron Collider at CERN near Geneva, um, announced the discovery of this brand new particle, the, the Higgs boson, and it was, it's uh, the, uh, the culmination, I mean, this discovery is an amazing triumph. It was the culmination of decades of work by thousands of physicists, and it really was, uh, um, it really was a fantastic triumph. Um, and it was the last remaining piece of the standard model puzzle to be plugged in. And so you might think that when, once this was plugged in, we all kind of turned to each other and said, wow, isn't this great, finally. 120 years later, but we finally you know, reached the, the end, Michelson's dreamed of end of physics. Is this what we said to each other? Absolutely not. We know for a fact that the standard model is not the complete picture. It is amazingly successful, but it, is not, it cannot be the complete picture of nature at its fundamental scales. Um, this interplay between uh, theory and experiment, and also we've learned our historical you know, lesson not to say things like that. Um, the, uh, but we also know that this interplay between, th between theory and experiment and these amazing paradigm shifts that happened in the 20th century also went over to other related fields of physics. And so we know for the fact that the standard model is incomplete. Um, but it's, it's so experimentally successful that any new, you know, new thing that comes has to build upon it. It still has to be true at the end of the day. Um, uh, and I can, uh, so the barrier that we face now in particle physics is not the same one that was in the 1890s, the one that Michelson is positing, you know, the, the question of as to whether we should even bother to keep searching for new physics. <clears throat> Excuse me. The barrier we face now is slightly different. It's the question of how to keep searching for new physics. And I'll give you a flavor of what I mean by showing you an aerial view, whoops, an aerial view of the Large Hadron Collider. So this is a 27-kilometer-around tunnel 
on the border of France and Switzerland, 100 meters under the ground, but to make it more local, um, this is what it would look like around lower Manhattan. Um, and so at the LHC, we collide two beams of protons at the highest energies mankind has ever used in a collider experiment, 13 tera electron volts. Um, so this gives you a, a sense of the scale. Of, and, and we have these two beams, and, any, any, and the place where we, uh, we uh, focus them together and collide them, we build a big detector there. And so, um, so this gives you a sense of the scope of some of these experiments. And to get up to higher energies, to the, the, the higher energies where the new revolutionary physics may be hiding, we need to build bigger machines. And so this is the next generation of machines. They're planned to be something like 100 kilometers around and collide particles at 100 tera electron volts. But is that it? Is that the only direction we can go? It absolutely has to happen, and this is, this is being planned, and this is absolutely the thing that, that needs to be done. But is that the only direction we can go? The answer is no, and this is where something called a dark photon comes in. This gamma is the symbol we often use for a photon, and the D just means dark. And so this is where a dark photon comes in. Um, but before we talk about a dark photon, we should probably familiarize ourselves with the regular photon. So the regular photon you know quite well. Um, it's the, uh, as you may have heard, be, depending on how you look at it, uh, light behaves uh, as either a wave or a particle. It has properties of both. And uh, the photon is the particle manifestation of light. And so um, when your camera uh, takes a photo, please, if you have cameras, take them out and take a photo of me posing like this. Um, and your camera will take, there we go, somebody's taking a photo. Your camera with that, uh, with that photo is, taking, is collecting a few billion photons. Um, when you're standing outside at noon, the, uh, the square meter around you is absorbing something like a thousand billion billion photons a second. Um, very bright and coherent photons make up lasers, and um, the, uh, the, some of the dimmest photons we know are those that have been traveling for 14 billion years from a fraction of a second after the Big Bang and are just now arriving uh, to, be, to, to be collected and um, uh, studied by astronomers. Um, the most energetic photons we know of come from astrophysical sources like hypernovae, and the least energetic we, uh, that we know of are the ones that carry the soft rock hits of the 70s via AM radio. Um, so you're very familiar with regular photons, um, or at least you think you are, because um, as a particle physicist, we have a different, uh, slightly different way of thinking about photons. In addition to all these things, it's also a special type of force-carrying particle. And to give you an appreciation of what I mean by that, um, I have to take a brief foray into collider physics and into quantum field theory, but I promise it will not be painful because you already basically know what a collision is. So you already know what macroscopic collisions are. So if you take two billiard balls, they smack together and fly apart, great. In physics, we like to keep track of things as they evolve in time. So we're gonna look at this same collision on a billiard table as it evolves in time. So uh, at, one, at some point in time, the balls are faced far apart, they get closer together, they smack together and fly apart. And we draw lines through this, and this gives us a trajectory of this collision as it happened in space-time. Okay, so, but these billiard balls are really moving pretty slow, and they're, they're pretty large, so if we want to go to the very, very smallest fundamental scales, the smallest uncuttable particle scales, and if we want to go to the, up to the highest energy, or the highest, uh, the highest speeds possible, like almost the speed of light, then the rules change, because quantum field theory takes over there, and you can't think of collisions in the same way. So instead of uh, billiard balls, let's collide something, another particle that you know quite well, and that we use quite a bit in collider physics, the electron. An electron and its antiparticle, the positron, as time goes on, they, they get closer together, something happens, and then an electron and positron come up the other side. Okay, what that something happens can be as a, co as a collision, and it can take a few forms. One of them is that they can pass right by each other. It's not very interesting. One thing they can do is they can actually uh, annihilate and create a new particle, and uh, according to the very strict rules of quantum the field theory, um, and this particle can then split into other particles. Another thing they can do, though, is they can get close enough to each other uh, so that they feel each other, and by feel, I mean they feel a force. Much like one planet can be said to feel the gravitational force of another one as they go around each other, these, this electron and positron can be said to feel the electromagnetic force between them. And in the particle level, what that means is they're actually exchanging another type of photon, uh, another type of particle, a special type of particle, um, a force-carrying particle. And for electromagnetism, this is the photon. Each one of the forces has a, f uh, a force-carrying particle associated with it. But is that all of them? The answer is no. This development of the standard model in the 20th century led us to understand that there were other fundamental forces that we had missed before, and one of them is called the strong force. This was discovered, and uh, this is the one that, that holds um, quarks bounded to protons and neutrons and hence keeps your body from flying apart and keeps the sidewalk from, uh, from dissolving underneath your feet, and its force carrier is called the gluon. Um, appropriate name. The, uh, the, uh, one of the other forces we found is called the weak force, and the weak force you probably best know is responsible for radioactive decay, and it's kind of an oddball because it has three different force-carrying particles asso associated with it, the W plus, W minus, and Z bosons, but is that all of them? The answer is that we don't know. There actually could be other fundamental forces out there, but 
Because so many people, it's physical forces, because so many people have been working on this for so long, so many clever people, and so many, uh, much cleverer than I, and so many, um, uh, so, many great ex so many experiments performed, we have narrowed down the possible way that we could have missed new forces, and hence new force-carrying particles, to a very few. One way is if the particles are supermassive, and what I mean by mass is not the typical, you know, like a massive bouncer at a bar type colloquial sense. Um, I, we're t at mass at the particle level is a very, it's an intrinsic property of a particle. And so, the, uh, so what I mean by mass, and if you remember E equals mc squared, this indicates an equivalence between energy and mass, and so we often measure, we often express the masses of fundamental particles in terms of energy. So you'll see this giga electron volt here. And so the proton, it's not a force carrier, but it's a particle you know quite well. The proton has a mass of about one giga electron volt. The newly discovered Higgs particle has a mass of about 125 times that. And then the most massive fundamental particle we know of is the top quark, and it has a mass of about 172 times that. And but for reference, the W and Z force carriers have masses closer to the Higgs, and the electron has a super small mass. Okay, so one way we could have missed new force, force carrying particles is if they're just super massive. We haven't built a large enough collider with enough energy to get up there. Like I said, we have to build a larger collider to get to higher energies to find the new particles. And that, like I said, that costs money. That's, that's not where you go and get the money. That's, that's, that take, you know, it costs money to get up there. And so, <clears throat> excuse me. Is that the only way? No, another one of the very, very few ways we could have missed new physical forces is if, uh, that, we, that we could have missed them so far is if they have a very small mass, smaller than the mass of the proton, and if they interact very, very slightly with our everyday electromagnetic world, our everyday world. Um, and you might think that doesn't make any sense because I just said that to get to the higher, um, uh, the higher masses, we need more money, so why haven't we covered the broke end of the spectrum already? Um, the answer comes from the fact that, the, of, from that very, very slightly interacting thing. So, um, what I mean by that is that the most important force, I, I went on the forces that we know, the most important force to us in terms of physics, in terms of experiment, um, is electromagnetism, because it's the only one we can do anything directly with. Okay, so with, in terms of instrumentation. We, so if some new physics effect doesn't eventually result in an electromagnetic interaction, we won't know about it, okay? So, um, so if nature had, for instance, conspired to hide some new force from us, new force carrying particle that had a very, very small mass and that also interacted really, really slightly with our everyday electromagnetic world, so slightly we'd never seen it before, we, it would have escaped the detection of all the previous experiments, okay? So and this is by contrast to the regular photon. We call it the dark photon, okay? So this would be a new force carrier. So, okay, you might be thinking that's, that's all well and good, man, but this is like a stab in the dark. Do you have any you know, external motivation for this beyond just it might exist? I mean, a lot of things might exist. That's a good question. I like the way you think. And the answer is yes, there's a lot of motivation. I'm gonna focus on just one thing, and it's because this dark actually has something to do with dark matter. So um, we all like to look at Hubble photographs. So take your favorite spiral galaxy, count up all the stuff you can see. That gives you the amount of luminous matter in the galaxy, okay? Now go down, pull out your favorite textbook on gravity, and take that number and put it into the equation that tells you how fast a star should be moving as a, fact of, uh, as a function of how far away from the center of the galaxy it is. You'll get this prediction, okay? Now go down to your local astronomer and get her to measure those speeds of those particles. They're totally off from the prediction. This means there has to be more stuff there than what we can see, and if it's not luminous, it's dark, that's where dark matter, this word dark matter comes from. Okay, now go down to your local astrophysicist and ask her to show you the energy budget of the universe. She'll tell you that there's over, that's the breakdown of all the, the stuff that exists in the universe. She'll tell you there's over five times as much dark matter as there is regular matter. Now go down to your local particle theorist and ask her what dark matter is. She'll tell you, we don't know. We have a lot of ideas, though. Um, and so on the experimental end, there are a lot of people looking for dark matter directly, direct detection, not necessarily uh, collider physicists like me, but other direct detection dark matter experiments. And, <clears throat> excuse me, and they have seen some weird things. And so I don't have time to go into it here, but I'm just gonna tell you, you get the dark matter experiment, uh, experimentalist into the room with a particle theorist, get them to talk together and compare notes and work it, work it out. Eventually, the particle theorist will turn to you and she'll say, you know, if there were a low mass, uh, if there were a new force carrying particle that had a mass a little less than the mass of the proton, and if it interacted really, really slightly with our everyday world, this would explain a lot of the dark matter craziness that she's seen, the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the dark matter experimentalist. And then as a, you know, as a particle, uh, as a collider physicist, you go, that's a dark photon. I might be able to cre uh, you know, create that in a collider experiment. So partially because of its uh, relationship to dark matter, partially for other reasons I don't have time to go into, and yes, partially just because um, this field of dark photon searching has heated up quite a bit in the last few years. So this is the state of things as of like 2008. And uh, that white space, completely unexplored. 
And that's exactly where a dark photon should live if it's going to help explain these dark matter anomalies. Now, flash forward to today, just six years later, and this is the state of things. Those, those shaded regions are exclusions, places where a dark, matter, uh, dark photon can't live, and the open uh, lines are uh, planned experiments to take place in the next few years. So what changed? Some theorists, in fact, Natalia Toro, Philip Schuster, Ruben Essig, and James Bjorken, pointed out that we can indeed look in this space for a dark photon, and we, do, we can do so on the cheap. They made some calculations, and they made the observation that we can use existing fixed target facilities that were built for other particle physics purposes to look for this dark photon. And so this is where all the experimentalists, we rub our hands together and say, yes, this is good, we can do this. And so these experiments are all over the world. They're in Russia, they're in um, uh, Germany, they're in Italy, uh, um, they're in California, um, and there are actually three experiments taking place that are planned to happen at, uh, uh, at a facility in Virginia called Thomas Jefferson National Accelerator facility, or Jefferson Lab. I'm going to focus briefly on one called Apex, because that's the one that I work on. Um, so Jefferson Lab, by, uh, by contrast to the LHC, where we collide two beams of protons at, at really high energies, like tera electron volts, at Jefferson Lab, it's one beam of electrons that you get up to the giga electron volts, GeV scale. And then that beam of electron goes into an experimental hall, OK? And then once it goes into the experimental hall, this is what it looks like for Apex. The beam comes in over my head. It goes uh, into, the, into this target enclosure, and then it, and it, where you hold a chunk of metal fixed. So what happens when the electrons encounter the, the chunk of metal? I don't know, let's look at the diagram. So the, uh, uh, a, collection of, uh, a, a chunk of metal is a dense collection of atoms with large nuclei, and so when an electron comes in, it gets close to the nucleus, they feel each other, and they exchange a photon. Okay, then they, as the electron bends around this nucleus, it spits off another photon, which splits into a couple of particles that we can detect. Okay, and then we, we detect those particles, and we calculate the mass of the particle they came from, and then we bend those up. And overwhelmingly, it's just a background noise shape, the smooth background shape. But occasionally, if a dark photon exists, you'll create a dark photon instead, but very, very rarely. And so you'd be looking, which has an actual mass, and so you're looking for a tiny bump on top of this smooth background thing. So we did this for the Apex experiment in, in July of 2010, where we held a test run, a proof of concept test run. Um, and in an ideal world, we would have seen something like this. You don't have to work too hard to convince somebody that that's like a bump, uh, but that's, in fact, a simulation, and what we saw was this. And if you think that doesn't look like anything, you're right. That was just a background spectrum. And in fact, the thing we'd be looking for would be a much subtler effect. It would look closer to the one on the right than the one on the left. But, so we did not see a dark photon, otherwise you would have heard about it, but we did rule out a small space where one can live. Um, and we proved the feasibility of the experiment, uh, which will happen sometime in the next couple of years, but like I said, other experiments are looking too, so this dark photon race is on. So, um, uh, so finally, what is a dark photon? A dark photon would be a new force-carrying particle, much like the regular photon is the force-carrying particle of electromagnetism. It's dark because it interacts so slightly with our everyday electromagnetic world that it's effectively been hidden from all previous experiments, and because it could help explain some of the odd astrophysical results related to dark matter. Um, it's uh, because it interacts so slightly with our everyday world, we need to perform specialized experiments, but at existing facilities to look for a tiny dark photon signal on top of a huge um, background. Excuse me. And uh, it's potentially revolutionary because it would, be the first, it, it would be the first unambiguous evidence of a fundamental particle not predicted by the wildly successful standard model that we know and love. But, I mean, I, you know, I know the crowd here a little bit um, uh, after spending the whole day here. Um, I, you know, I have a, uh, what, you know, what, what would this do for you? I mean, what, what, what would you get if, if we found a dark photon? I mean, would you be, soon be able to, I don't know, take dark photos with your phone? I, I, I possibly, probably not. I mean, maybe I'm the wrong person to ask, though, because I'm an experimentalist, not a product developmentalist. I mean, I look for uh, a dark photon because I'm interested in the fundamental open questions of physics, like what is dark matter? And more importantly, I look for a dark photon because I look at this plot and I think, hmm, I wonder what's there, much like when you're hiking, you look at a hill and think, hmm, I wonder what could be in that next hidden valley. Um, you know, we push the limits of human knowledge because we're curious. Um, that being said, I do know that the simple pushing of the limits of human knowledge for curiosity's sake by my particle physics forebears has led eventually to such things as CT scans, PET scans, um, major advances in RF power, the World Wide Web. I have no idea what the discovery of dark photon will mean beyond expanding our understanding of the universe. The rest of it will be up to you. So at the end of the day, though, um, is it possible that every single one of these experiments could come up completely empty? Yes, absolutely. I mean, these are experiments because, you know, this, these are experiments, and in particle physics, there's no such thing as failure. Because even if you don't find something, you've still gained an important piece of information about nature. The only failure is to stop searching. Thank you. <laughs>